They're meant to be teaching a two-state solution. So what we decided to do at Palestinian Media Watch is to analyze every single item that we gathered through the year of 2017 and see what type of a picture we came out with. What you're about to see, the next four slides, are the picture that we came out of. Slide number one. Slide number one talks about introducing you to the idea of a four-point terror plan. That's what we discovered exists. What are those four points? Point number one. Point number one is very, very simple. Let's look at what we're seeing. This. Two-state solution. Does the Palestinian Authority support a two-state solution? This is a summer camp from last year. There's a one-state solution, we see that clearly, where all of Israel, from the river to the sea, is Palestine. That in and of itself is in breach of the decision because we're trying to educate children to a two-state solution. What's this? It's a key. What does the key symbolize in Palestinian society? The key symbolizes the right of return. You've taught your children that all of this area, from the river to the sea, is mine, and that every single one of the Palestinian refugees who left Israel in, 19, in 1948 will return to their home. You are creating an expectation that can never be fulfilled in a reality that doesn't exist. That's the starting point. How can you ever then come to a peace agreement where you can't meet those requirements? Palestine in all of the area from the river to the sea and the return of every refugee back to his home. Where his home is, that's a whole different story. But how do you, how do you create that reality? That's step number one. Step number, number two is very, very simple. Step number two is very, very akin also to the Nazi ideology. And these days with the Holocaust Memorials, uh, uh, Memorial Day, it's something that you have to discuss. Nazi ideology started with the first idea was Lebensraum. Outside of our borders, it used to be ours. It was stripped from us illegally, and we need to take it back. That's a start. What was the second part of the plan? Second part of the plan is you add in a little bit of hate speech. All of that is ours. Oh, and by the way, the people who inhabit it are despicable people. This is Imad Khamato. He can never live in peace as long as the Jews are in the land of Israel. If a fish in the sea fights another fish, who's behind it? <laughs> See, you can laugh at that because it is laughable. It's disgusting. It's despicable. This guy is on Palestinian TV, official TV. Let me explain that official TV. Remember Pravda? People don't understand the, day that the idea of an official TV media that's completely controlled by the government, says nothing against the government, and only gives over the messages of the government. Iran, Palestinian Authority, it's the same thing. So here you've got Imad Khamato saying that when a fish fights another fish, the Jews are behind it. Imad Khamato is one of those crazies from the Hamas. Unfortunately, he's not. What was Imad Khamato's prize for this? What would you do if you're Mahmoud Abbas? You're the one who's running around the world saying we support the two-state solution and what a disaster is that Jerusalem was recognized as Israel's capital because it endangers the two-state solution. What do you do with this guy? <laughs> Mahmoud Abbas's answer was very simple. You are appointed to be the head of a school system. He should be the one educating the next generation. <clears throat> Step three is really the direct result of step one and step two. Step three is you've prepared your population, you've told the Jew then that Israel, all of Israel, was stolen from us. The people who live there are responsible for all the evil in the world, even to fish fighting in the sea. What do you need to do with those people? 
You know the answer. And they say it clearly. Go and kill them. Direct incitement. Kill them to the last one. Punish the wicked Jews. Count their number. That's what it is. But you're not just talking about crazy religious figures. You're talking about child abuse. How can I say child abuse? Child abuse is when you take a child and you distort anything that they could ever believe is right and you fashion them into a weapon to be used against someone else. Children that are born are not inherently bad. Children are born inherently good. The way that you teach them, the way that you educate them, you can, you can create good children and you can create bad children. The Palestinian Authority, unfortunately, believes in the idea of Israel's weakness, that Israel will be more lenient to children. They will use that to use and abuse the, the, the entire system. But what will they do to start with? This is what they'll do. They will teach you to throw stones at the Jews. Read the instructions very clearly. Stand stably, balance your legs, focus your gaze on the center of the target, keep the desired balance and your weapon. You are the one that controls your weapon, not the other way around. If you didn't understand this, read it again. And if you didn't understand it, still, here's a picture. Put an adult. You want to fight the occupation? Fine, I understand that. Put an adult. Put someone who knows what they're doing. Put an eight-year-old child. Why are the children part of that equation? Step four, which really culminates everything, is glorification of terrorism and rewarding terrorism. Two very, very nice pastoral pictures, right? It looks good. This is a very nice kid from a, a school in Ramallah um, receiving a, 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 the football cup for the competition that his team had just won. The competition is named after a guy called Ahmed Manatsra. Ahmed Manatsra, anyone know the name? Ahmed Manatsra is a 13-year-old boy from the same school who picked up a knife and went with his cousin and stabbed a Jewish kid in, the, in Jerusalem. Stabbed him in the neck. Mahmoud Abbas would make him famous saying that the Jews had executed him. Bibi Netanyahu would break every law possible, truly but sometimes you have no choice. And he would send television crews into Ahmed Manatsra's hospital room to see that he was, be A, that he was alive, and B, that he was being treated by Jewish doctors. What message does that give to the children? What do you have to do to have a football competition named after you? Do you have to be an excellent footballer? No, what do you have to do? Stab Jews. Try and kill Jews and you will become famous. What do you think these kids want to do now? Do they want to become excellent footballers? Or do they want to go and stab Jews? Who's this? This is a Palestinian sweetheart. Her name is Dalal Mugrabi. Dalal Mugrabi in 1978 got on a bus on the coastal road of, Jerusalem, of, of Israel and slaughtered 37 people. Twelve children. This picture of her glorifying her as the hero of the Palestinian Authority was put up fit for the 53rd anniversary of the Fatah party. Fatah, Mahmoud Abbas, the guy who's making peace, his party is the Fatah. 53rd anniversary of the Fatah party. That was in December 2017. Right? So that means for the occupation, 53 years since the occupation, now we're going to commemorate the people that we see as heroes, right? What's 7 minus 3? It's 4. So how can it be 53 years since the creation of the party to liberate the West Bank? It's not. It was created in 1964. What was it trying to liberate? Let's go back quickly. What was it trying to liberate? All of that. 
Mahmoud Abbas's party was created in 1964. Their idea has been and always will be the liberation of all of Palestine from the river to the sea. They have the, the UK government um, just approved its annual 20 million dot pounds to the Palestinian Authority. It goes to the general budget. You, anyone here who's paying taxes, is paying a salary for, to a terrorist. That's where your money is going. That's the first bit. The next bit is based on the idea of the Palestinians understanding that law enforcement is something which has to be done. Um, law enforcement is much more difficult when you're talking about minors. Um, and so what are we going to do? We're going to send our minors out to be, the, to be the terrorists. That's what we believe in. That's what we've shown with the picture from Twitter. That's, we pay the minors a salary. So it really does pay for poor families to send their children out to attack the Jews because they get paid. And the IDF is going to have to arrest these poor little minors. We can take great pictures of that. And that looks bad. So in 2013, UNICEF put out a report saying that Israel's treatment of the Palestinian children is despicable. It amounts to a crime against humanity. It will say in their report that children should never be brought before military courts that are inherently incapable of dealing with minors. Great argument. Great argument. How do they deal with Article 66 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which says that in areas such as Judea and Samaria, international law, what courts can be set up? Military courts. So let's follow UNICEF's idea on. If you're a minor, you cannot stand trial before military courts that are inherently incapable of dealing with you. And Israel can only set up military courts, so where do you stand trial? Nowhere. You have impunity. We'll make the argument a little bit stronger because we understand that that's a little bit weak. We will say that the system is discriminatory. What will we argue? We'll argue that in the Israeli legal system, the civilian legal system, only 17% of minors are held on remand pending trial. In the military system, 70% of the minors will be held on, on remand pending trial because they're Palestinians. That is inherently discriminatory, right? Has to be. The problem with that argument is very, very simple. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. Because you want to make a comparison, you have to com make a comparison between two systems that are comparable and deal with the same types of offences. So if you have the Israeli legal system which deals with every spectrum of offences that can be committed by a minor, starting from public drunkenness, <coughs> stealing a Mars bar from a shop, um, drug abuse, petty theft, stealing car radios, I know they don't do that anymore, I apologise. Um, You've got the whole spectrum of offences. So out of those offences, and some of them are violent crimes, who's going to be arrested on remand pending trial of that group? The violent offenders, right? Because that's the way the system works. You want to take violent offenders and say, you shouldn't be or continue to be a danger to the public. You should be in jail. So what, why, is that, why does that support the argument that there's no discrimination? This is why. <coughs> Remember, we mentioned then the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords will divide up Judea and Samaria into three different areas, A, B, and C. A is pretty much entirely under the authority of the Palestinian Authority. B, Israel has security control, but public, secu uh, uh, public order is under the Palestinian Authority. And area C, 90% of the Palestinians will live in area B and C, B, B and A. Okay, those two areas. Where the jurisdiction for dealing with Petty crime is theirs. The military courts do not deal with those crimes. If a Palestinian is getting drunk in a local park, I don't care, that's not my problem. If he is using drugs, I don't care, that's not my problem. If he is stealing a Mars bar from the local corner shop, I don't care, that's not my problem. He will not get to me. Who am I dealing with? Security offences and terrorism, basically. So the minors that I'm dealing with are all violent offenders. So now we can make a comparison between the two systems. Violent offenders are arrested on remand pending trial 
in the civilian system, and violent offenders are arrested pending trial in the military system. That's the comparison. When you compare the offenses that are committed by the two groups, you'll see that it's the same offenses. When you compare the system as a whole, you're comparing apples and elephants. One's an elephant, deals with everything, and the other one's just an apple. It deals with a small group of offenses that, that can't be compared to anything else. Who's this? You should all look at the picture. You should all know that, these, that what you're looking at there are two of the people who got the closest to being angels walking in our midst. Truly. People who lived a life of simplicity, of giving. She's a nurse. They have their own children. They've adopted and fostered other children. Truly amazing, amazing people. Her name is Daphna Meir. Daphna Meir is no longer with us. Remember a name from this speech? Morad Adais. Morad Adais. That's the name that should be up there along with every other name that you can think of of evil. Morad Adais is 16 years old. He will break into Daphna's house. She's standing outside on the phone. He will wait for her to go back inside. He will break into her kitchen, pushing the door open, which was open. And in front of her children, will stab her to death with such force. I apologize for the graphic description, but it has to be understood to understand the story. With such force, he will stab her over and over again, that the knife will be embedded in her skull, unable to pull it out. Murad Adais will tell us in his, in his interrogation that having murdered Daphna, he went home, he washed his hands, and sat down to watch a film with his family. But why did you murder Daphna? What had she done to you? Nothing. Jews are bad. That's what I was watching on television in the morning. I thought it was right, so I went out and killed Daphna. That's how you corrupt a child. So what do you do with Morada Dice if you're UNICEF? Children cannot be tried before the military courts that are inherently capable of, of dealing with children. And you've got a 60-year-old murderer. Do I give him impunity? Do I let him go? Absolutely not. Stood trial. I was in charge of the prosecution. He went to jail. He got his life sentence. May he rot in jail for the rest of his life. But how does UNICEF understand that? They don't. They don't care. How do we know that the Fourth Geneva Convention took into account that children would stand trial before the military courts? After their report in 2013, um, I asked the Israeli establishment, the military, um, the foreign ministry, the justice ministry, to allow me, an officer in the army, to hold discussions with the UN. Israel doesn't like the UN. The army hates the UN. The idea of an officer in the army, however high-ranking he may be, Talking to the UN was just crazy. Somehow they agreed. So I asked them, what should we do with Murad Adais? What do you propose? What did you base your, your argument on that military courts are in, inherently incapable of dealing with minors? Well, it was never taken into account in the Geneva Conventions. They didn't really have the idea of juvenile justice then. And, but it's something that we believe to be true. Unfortunately, the, 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 the downside of being a lawyer um, and the downside of dealing with these people and actually having to learn international law is that you read international law. The Gen Fourth Geneva Convention specifically deals with children standing trial before the military courts. How do I know that? Article 68 of the Fourth Geneva Convention says that in military courts, the death sentence can be handed down to certain people. Who can it not be handed down to? Minors. Did the authors of the, Geneva, of the Fourth Geneva Convention take into account that minors would stand trial before the courts? Answer, obviously yes. So how do you explain that? Well, that's just a, talking about the death sentence. It, it isn't really relevant. It doesn't really teach us anything. Okay. These are the numbers. You don't have to look at the numbers. There's going to be no test at the end. How many Palestinian minors are there in Judean Samaria? Guess? 
million. Over a million. There's a tremendous site, which is a tremendous source of great information. It's called the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics. <coughs> you can generally uh, uh, attribute that site with uh, uh, the great saying of lies, damn lies, and statistics. Because when you want to inflate the size of your population or downplay the, the, the size of the economy or manipulate any other figure for your uh, uh, benefit, that's what you do. So a great site to use to, you, to get information on the Palestinian Authority is their site. Their site that says there's over a million Palestinian children. How many do we actually arrest? 1,000. 800 a year. How many Jews were there? before the start of the, of the Second World War? 18, 19, 20 million, let's say. How many were, how many were murdered? Six million. 33%, let's say. 35%. <coughs> that would be considered to be a massive attack directed at a civilian population, right? That's what I would argue. If, you're, if there's a million Palestinian miners and we're arresting a thousand, immediately transferring 349 to the Palestinian Authority and indicting 465, some of them for attempted murder and membership in terrorist organizations, would you consider that to be reasonably a widespread attack on the civilian population? Just logic. Don't need law. Don't need anything else. If this big, bad IDF machine is trying to punish the Palestinian miners, there's a million of them, how many am I going to arrest? 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. Let's get to real numbers. To get to the 33%, I have to arrest 330,000 Palestinian miners every year. I arrest 1,000. Of those, I prosecute less than half. UNICEF will call that widespread, systematic, and institutionalized ill treatment. Those three words do not appear in any other UNICEF report around the world. Bashar Assad is murdering children, is gassing them to death. That's not widespread, systematic, and institutionalized. Why are those words so important? Exactly. Article 7 of the, of the Rome Convention, the International Criminal Court, a direct attack on a civilian population that is widespread, systematic and institutionalized. But Assad's gassing people to death. I'm arresting a thousand people because they're murderers. And I'm committing a crime against humanity. UNICEF will finish off by saying there's 38 recommendations that until they are implemented, Israel will continue to be a war criminal. One of them is to stop the use of solitary confinement in, with Palestinian miners. Okay? Solitary confinement is bad. You take a kid, you throw him in a cell, in a dungeon. He has to be there for at least 22 hours a day by himself to meet the definition of solitary confinement. Um, and that's bad. There's a report from a special rapporteur that says the effect of solitary confinement on people is bad. Okay, we've understood that. So I'm trying to explain to UNICEF, what exactly are you talking about? What are you talking about? We have two detention centers in, 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 in Judea and Samaria, one for the northern area, for, for Samaria, one for Judea. Okay? If there's a thousand people being arrested every year, 349 are being already transferred to the Palestinian Authority, that leaves you with about 650, let's say 700. Two areas. 365 days a year, times two, 730. I don't even have enough miners a day to fill each of the centers. So in many occasions, I will have how many miners in a detention center? One. He will be in that cell by himself. Is that solitary confinement? UNICEF, is that solitary confinement? Yes, of course it is. That's solitary confinement, that's bad. Okay. But what about the provision in the Convention on the Rights of the Child that says when you arrest children, you must hold them separately from adults, which is part of the law. So am I upholding the law when I keep him by himself? Or am I holding him in solitary confinement? Which one is it? 
If you would like to tell us that you can hold the minor that's in the detention center by himself, and that's okay, because it's not solitary confinement, all good. Or say that Israel has the right to hold Palestinian minors in a cell together with adults. No, no, we can't do that. But which one do you want? By the way, in the prison service, which isn't even run by the IDF, it's the, the, the civilian services, there's no such thing as solitary confinement. It's not used for Palestinian minors. It's not used for any minors. Um, that would be the completion. So we would try and argue to you to understand what they're saying. We would get no answers. Then we would understand that there's a group running around uh, um, called DCI Palestine, Defense of the Child International, well-recognized, good organization, doing good for children. And then you get to Palestine. This organization is running around the world at the moment with a campaign called No Way to Treat a Child. What they're talking about is not the child abuse of the Palestinian Authority, it's how Israel arrests and prosecutes Palestinian minors. They will come up with a world of different arguments. They will write a whole rep entire report in 2012. UNICEF will adopt that report, almost plagiarism in 2013. <laughs> now, in the No Way to Treat a Child, which is now spreading also to the UK, um, they will base their argument against, the, against Israel on what? On UNICEF's report. But really, it's their own report. They have a video that goes with it. One of the stars of the video is Ahmed. Ahmed. Ahmed, the 15-year-old Palestinian kid who was ill-treated by, by the big bad idea. Ahmed will say, look, they put me in solitary confinement. This is 32 and a half minutes into the film. At this stage of the film, the audience is so emotionally invested in what they've been told that they are incapable of seeing any facts. Incapable. And they will rely on that ability or that inability to understand anything because you're seeing emotions and facts don't or shouldn't cloud your judgment. 32 minutes and 24 seconds. 32 minutes and 25 seconds. Ahmed explains. There is more than one person. <laughs> what does that mean there's more than one person? Solitary confinement, by definition, you're there by yourself 23, 22 hours a day at least. And sometimes they put you alone. Well, of course sometimes they put you alone because there isn't always another, another minor. How do you explain that? How do you explain that desire to believe in something which simply isn't true? That's what they did. They will come up with, uh, with another great idea which, is, which uh, um, every crime organization in the world is trying to adopt as well. One of the other recommendations is that once a complaint is put in against a soldier, let's say soldier slash policeman, until that complaint is found manifestly unfounded, that soldier slash policeman should be suspended. Why are every, every crime organization in the world trying to adopt that standard? Because it means there's no policeman in the world. You put in a complaint against any policeman until it's positively found to be manifestly unfounded, the policeman's suspended. So you have no policeman ever walk in the streets. So I said to you, and he said, so what do you base that standard on? Where's a country in the world that has that as their standard? Where's the country? It doesn't exist. It simply doesn't exist because that's not how law enforcement works. That's why you have the police investigation departments in every police station in, in the world. You have a whole entire mechanism in England, um, the, 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 the police complaints uh, uh, um, um, authority, uh, it's, not, it's not authority, commission. Um, because that's what happens. Sometimes in law enforcement, people abuse their rights, people abuse their power, and they need to be investigated. Sometimes they need to be prosecuted. But a standard of guilty until found not guilty doesn't exist anywhere for a policeman. So how can UNICEF say, until Israel adopts that standard, Israel will continue to be a war criminal? We're never going to be able to be there. We'll never get there. 
That standard does not exist, will not exist, and will not be adopted. So there's no way we're ever getting out of that situation. So NGO Monitor, I left the army and I've decided I have this uh, uh, um, pet hate, it's called UNICEF. My discussions, my explanations, my endless answers to them did nothing to persuade them. Otherwise, they would put out a, an update report to their 2013 report. Some people would say that it was the most positive document ever written by Israel, but, uh, about Israel by the UN. It still called us a war criminal. That's how low Israel's standards are, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to the UN. So I decided now that I've left the, the army, um, I'm writing a response. I wrote a comprehensive response to every claim that they made, where it says that this is simply not true, where this isn't a standard that's applied by international law, where this is a standard that you've just made up. And there's no reason why Israel should be held to a higher standard than everybody else in the world. Are we free of criticism? Absolutely not. Should we be held to a standard that doesn't exist anywhere else? Absolutely not. That's not what it's about. We will then continue to look into UNICEF and we will discover an amazing thing. UNICEF, all the time that they're talking to me, will continue to fund the same Palestinian NGOs that fed into their original report. There's a mechanism set up by the Security Council which was designed to combat the idea of recruitment of child soldiers called the MRM mechanism. <coughs> That's what they're meant to do. UNICEF is in charge of that mechanism all over the world. Um, and UNICEF will be using that mechanism to feed every type of statistic, every type of claim that the Palestinian Joes can make, whether they be true, whether they be not be true, it doesn't matter. We're paying them for a product. They provide that product with cherries on top. It sounds good, it looks good, it demonizes Israel, so that's great. We will then launder those claims and we will put our stamp on it as the UN, as UNICEF. It's children, it's fluffiness, it all looks good. To the point where UNICEF will receive a contribution from Canada. $10 million, a million dollars of that went to UNICEF OPT as they call it, Occupied Palestinian Territories. The money was donated for disaster preparedness. Why disaster preparedness? Every hundred years or so, Israel experiences a major earthquake. Right? We're sitting on the African-Syrian Rift Valley. That's the Jordan Valley. Every hundred years or so, there's a big earthquake. We haven't had a big earthquake for over 117 years. It doesn't bode well for us. And it doesn't work very well for the Palestinian Authority. So the idea is to teach the, teach the teachers how to save the lives of the children. What will UNICEF do with that money? UNICEF will take that money and give it to a, 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 to a bunch of volunteers that, that come from, a, 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 or that are organized by the World Council of Churches, an organization which is particularly, particularly anti-Israel, and they will send those volunteers to accompany the Palestinian children to schools through the checkpoints. One of the volunteers will go back and write on her blog that the poor Palestinian children have no choice but to revert to stabbing the Jews because the Jews no longer give them guns. <laughs> That's a good argument, right? You're promoting human rights. <coughs> UNICEF will give that money for their tr the training of those people. They will come back, they will provide the exact results that they want, that the, that the IDF is preventing Palestinian children from getting to school and they need constant accompaniment. That's the argument. That's where the money will go. Hopefully in the next week and a half there will be a, de a, a debate in the, in the Canadian uh, Parliament. They're rediscussing the whole idea of funding to UNICEF. Um, it just happens to be five years since their last uh, 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 decision. Um, and the hope is that Canada, as it, as it did previously with UNRWA, um, the other UN organization, 
will say that considering the abuses of our money, we are no longer going to give you money. Every government should do the same. Because the money isn't going to not helping children, not saving children, not educating teachers. It's going to demonization of Israel. That's what UNICEF does. The picture sounds very, very bleak. Because their only goal is to blacklist us. When I got off the plane in England, I thought, to my, I thought twice. I haven't been here for a long time. Am I about to be arrested as a war criminal? I was the head of the prosecution. I'm the one who was in charge of sending these Palestinian children to jail. Am I going to be arrested? Thank God I didn't. I'm here in front of you. Um, but that thought truly did cross my mind. Because that's their goal. These same groups have now put in a, a complaint to the International Criminal Court to have Israel prosecuted for crimes against humanity as for their treatment of children. The second part is to get Israel sanctioned. The MRM blacklist, the UN Security Council, get the IDF on the list alongside Boko Haram, the, the group that like kidnaps girls and then whatever, you know exactly what, um, and the Taliban and ISIS, people cut off, cutting people's heads off, and the IDF for prosecuting children, some of them murderers. <coughs> what does UNICEF say that it's incapable of doing? Remember this slide? Membership in terrorist organizations? So one of the criteria for the blacklisting is recruitment of child soldiers. This, membership in a terrorist organization, means that was, there was recruiting of child soldiers into what they call the Palestinian factions. Palestinian factions reads terrorist group, reads Hamas, reads PFLP, Popular Fund for Liberation of Palestine, reads Palestinian Islamic Jihad, reads children digging attack tunnels. UNICEF will argue in a report that they put out just very recently, they will say that, unfortunately, because of the circumstances, we're incapable of gathering information about the recruitment of Palestinian children into the Palestinian factions. What does that mean? Oh, I understand. Because the groups that you have, the organizations that you have are part of your working group, most of them have an affiliation of one kind or another to those very same terrorist groups. They are defending those terrorist groups as part of the mechanism to, to, to blacken the, the name of the IDF. UNICEF will ignore the numbers, will ignore, the, ignore this information that exists. You have people being prosecuted in court. They have the right to remain silent. They have the right to be represented by an attorney of their choice. They have their parents present during the court appearances. They will stand up in court and say, I plead guilty to the charges because plea bargains are good. And they take the plea bargains, including recruitment to terrorist organizations. UNICEF will say, yeah, but I'm not using the numbers of the courts because they're biased and they shouldn't be prosecuting children in any case. But ignore the fact that we're prosecuting them. The phenomena exists. Have you ever seen a recommendation of UNICEF to blacklist a terrorist organization that operates in Judea and Samaria? Doesn't exist. They have never said one bad word, not about the Hamas, not about the PFLP, not about Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and not even about the Fatah. When I showed the head of UNICEF uh, uh, um, the tweet of the little boy throwing stones, she said, no, 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 you've misunderstood. That's incitement. We don't deal with incitement. We only deal with recruitment. So that makes it good, right? As bleak as the situation sounds, I, uh, uh, um, the message that I've received from the other talks is that it's not all bad. It's truly not all bad. Alongside all of the garbage that the, uh, these organizations are spewing, Israel is still flourishing. Israel is still growing. Um, the economy is growing. Um, the situation is, in general, very good. Um, and just getting better from day to day to day to day. Um, there's, but there's still a water fight. And that war to fight is the war of information. The war of information means that providing people like yourselves with as much information as possible in order to combat the arguments that are being made. So this is a, um, 
This is my best uh, 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 solution for that. The two organizations that I work, work for, Palestinian Media Watch and NGO Monitor, Palestinian Media Watch, you will see everything that the Palestinian Authority says. You will see that, the, according to the Palestinians, who was the first Palestinian victim of Jewish barbarism? Could you help me? Jesus. Jesus. Again, you can laugh. It's there on the site. They say it every day. Because that's their roots. Apparently. And at NGO Monitor, you will find the responses that I wrote. Uh, um, I, provide, I gave uh, uh, Sammy an example of, 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 of some of the, uh, the booklets. Um, there's a whole section there on, on military justice. Um, it's been added on since I, uh, I joined them. Um, and it provides a response to UNICEF Enterprise, the response to DCI Palestine, and their whole campaign of no way to treat a child, where they distort the facts, where they misquote the law, where they just simply lie, where they say that their lawyers persuade the Palestinian miners to take plea bargains, even though their clients insist on their innocence. What's that called? That's called a breach of ethics. That's called play that, 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 that's, that, that's called perjury. If you're a, a defense attorney and you're representing a client and your client says, I am innocent, I am innocent, I am innocent, I am innocent, you cannot put him on a, 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 in front of a judge and say, confess to be, be, to, be, to be guilty. And it's a charity. It's, a, it's an organization that doesn't need to be paid. It's not a problem of I don't have the means. They're receiving grants from all over the world. They're receiving grants from UNICEF. Defend the children. If the child says, I am innocent, so do everything you can in order to defend the child. They admit in their report that they just persuade them to, to plead guilty. Because that's OK. That you'll find at uh, uh, NGO Monitor. Um, the second suggestion is my contact details. You can write them down. Sammy has a, 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 a copy of the whole presentation, apart from the video, um, to spread around. I can give you cards. Feel free to contact me with any question. I will try and provide you with as much information as possible, with examples, with evidence of whatever you're trying to uh, uh, um, explain or argue. To the best of my ability, I don't have sources for everything, but we have a lot of information that's gathered. Um, we're now writing a report at Palestinian Media Watch on the Palestinian school books. Palestinian school books are a disaster. Are a disaster. The next generation is being educated to hate and to a reality where Israel doesn't even exist, let alone a two-state solution. Um, that will be coming out soon. Um, that's all I have to say, at least for the moment. Um, and I would open to questions. Yes, sir. Given what, given what you say about the Palestinians and, uh, and your experience, why do Israeli leaders meet and greet the Palestinian leaders, shake their hands, pose for photographs, and go through the charade of pretending that they mean to make peace. So, <coughs> one of the sticking points for Benjamin Netanyahu, the, president, the Prime Minister for a long time now, um, with Mahmoud Abbas, is his demand that Mahmoud Abbas recognize that Israel is the home of the Jewish people. Which he won't. Which he won't, and he hasn't, they haven't met for years. They haven't met for years, and they won't meet for years. Mahmoud Abbas is, I don't know if you saw him recently on his, uh, on his rant after uh, um, uh, um, President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital. Um, he went back and he said things that he says all the time, but suddenly it was more, uh, more, more difficult to more, ignore. More, more, more difficult to ignore, let's say, that the Jewish people doesn't exist, it didn't exist. He says that every day. What's his argument? Judaism is a religion, not a people. Because a people deserves a country. 
like them. There are people, they deserve a country. A religious group doesn't deserve a country because religions can exist everywhere. Um, that there's no historical connection of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. He hasn't read, never mind the Balfour Declaration, he hasn't read the Mandate for Palestine. League of Nations. Mandate for Palestine says, in recognition of the historical Jewish connection to the land of Israel. In three years' time or five years' time in 2022, they're going to have to have the same hate fest that they had against uh, uh, the Balfour Declaration against the UN. Because the UN sanctioned the mandate. Um, and the problem is, we need peace. My son is 17. In a year's time, I'm sending him to the army. Nobody wants to send their children to fight. Nobody wants to send that to see any other child in a position where they have a gun pointed at them. We need to get to peace. We need to find someone who we can talk to. Maybe there is no one. So the question is, how do we get to that? How do we get to the situation where we change that paradigm, which is something that we have to do against an argument of this is all mine and you need to be dead. There isn't much to say. Can I ask a question? Yes. While everybody's thinking. If you're in, in the city centre over the last two weeks, on the last two Saturdays, there have been demonstrations on the concert hall steps, specifically about <clears throat> a Palestinian minor called Ahed Tamim. Ahed Tamim. Right. And they're using that as an excuse to basically, again, brand the IDF about all the things they do to minors, but they've now identified a specific individual and they're using her as an example. I was wondering if you could comment on that. I'm saying that there have been demonstrations in Glasgow city centre specifically about a, a Palestinian juvenile called Ahed Tamimi, who is a 16-year-old girl that has been detained for a number of things, including slapping an Israeli soldier while on duty in her village. And I'm asking Morris to maybe make a comment about that specific case, if he can, because it's been used by a number of groups in a way to basically back bash the IDF. So Ayatamimi, Ayatamimi, to understand Ayatamimi, you have to know who her father is. Ayatamimi's father is a guy called Basem Tamimi. Basem Tamimi was convicted five years ago of organizing the children of his village to ambush IDF soldiers. What do you do? The IDF soldiers are standing in front of you. You send a group of kids to throw stones at them. The IDF soldiers will follow in. And then the groups on the side throw stones at them. That's what Basem Tamimi thought was the right thing to do with the children of his village. That's the environment into which I had grew up. She is no less a product of child abuse than any of the others. That's the environment that she goes up seeing her mother attacking Israeli soldiers because that's the right thing to do. I personally ran, was in court with her mother as well. I will grow into that, will grow up into that environment, and, she will be, and the world will be told that for the one video that went viral, where you saw Ahit Tamimi slapping the soldiers and the soldiers did nothing, the big bad IDF mechanism has run into force and is now holding her on remand pending trial. Just for that. But didn't I just say that we're only going to hold violent criminals? So how does that go together? What they won't tell you is that that's not the first time Ayatollah Mimi has, has done that. It's the third time. Recidivism in violent crimes is definitely a reason to hold people in on remand pending trial. What they also won't tell you is that alongside slapping soldiers, she takes part in the family business. What's the family business? Throwing stones at soldiers. She will be throwing stones at soldiers not only with her hands, but also with slingshots. That's already the good bit in comparison to everything else, but at least in comparison to the end. After Ahed Tamimi has slapped the Israeli soldiers, Neriman Tamimi, her mother, with all her Facebook followers, with everything that's gone viral, will ask her, Ahed, Give a message to the Palestinian people in response to Donald Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. 
Ahed's response will be, Palestinian people needs to show unity. Every person has the responsibility to attack the Jews to their capability. Whoever can throw stones should throw stones. And those that can go out and commit suicide attacks should do that too. Direct incitement to blowing people up just because they're human beings is in any circumstances cause to remand a suspect pending trial. Because you've proved time and time again that you are violent and that there's no limits to your violence that even considering the tremendous amount of followers that she has and that her mother has, she's calling for suicide attacks. What happens if one of these crazies actually gets up, says, I'm going to do what I had said to me and blows up a bus with 30 people on? Is that sufficiently bad? Do I need to wait for her to do it again? I do not. I will not. Human rights means that I respect human rights. Human rights that means that I respect, above other things, the right to life. And if in order to preserve the right to life, I need to put Ahe Tamimi in jail, then let her sit in jail. And those that want to argue that she's simply a victim of activism, that's their problem. You can't hold, by the way, you can't hold the stick from both ends. You can't praise her for being this brave activist and then say, well, Israel shouldn't arrest her because she's an activist. You're praising her. You're pushing, into a, pushing her into being an activist. You're pushing her into being violent. So because you've pushed her into being violent, I then need to release her to, to carry out more violence? That's Ayatamimi. Don't let anyone else tell you different. <clears throat> because that's what she was indicted for. Had it been simply the event that was seen virally on Facebook of her slapping, swatting the soldiers alone, she wouldn't have been arrested pending, uh, 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 pending trial. She would have been arrested, she would have been interrogated, she would have been released on bail, and that would have been it. I'm not willing to die because Ayat Tamimi wants to go free. I'm not willing to die because Palestinian supporters think that she's a great activist. I'm not willing to let my children die. And if they are, because when bombs blow up, bombs don't see color, bombs don't see race, bombs don't see religion. 2011, um, a bomb uh, 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 blows up in Jerusalem outside the, the, uh, um, uh, the convention center. One victim. Her name is Mary Jane Gardner. She's a British tourist. She's not Jewish. She's not a settler. She's not one of these crazy fanatics that they want to kill. Terrorism doesn't see color, doesn't see religion. If they're willing for their children to die because Ayi Tamimi says that people should go and carry out suicide bombs, that's their problem. I'm not the bad guy. Next question, please. Lisa. So hate crimes is, 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 is a bad, it's just a bad word. It's just a bad word. Um, there is without question ideologically motivated crimes which possibly go into that, into that square of hate crimes. The problem is that Israel, um, similar to many other countries in the world, has an exception to hate crimes. It's not a hate crime and it's not incitement if what's being quoted is a religious text. There's a very, very famous uh, uh, um, Palestin uh, 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 Muslim hadith. A hadith is, a, is the stories that surround the Quran. Um, they have great force. It's not the Quran exactly. It's stories around. Um, that says that at the end of days, the trees and the stones will call to the Muslim believers saying, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. <coughs> right? 
That's what the Hadith says. So if you put up a caricature of a tree standing and a Jew standing behind the tree and the tree is calling out to the Muslim believer, hey, believer, there's a Jew behind me, come and kill me. Is that incitement? Logically, you would say that that's an incitement. Legally, that's a problem because that's a religious belief. <clears throat> putting, putting those two together, sometimes the result is an absurd. But for that, I've never prosecuted anyone because I know that I would lose. But call, saying go out and kill Jews, for that I've prosecuted hundreds of people. Um, in 2015, when the, when, the, 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 when the lone wolf, the knife attack started, um, I initiated in Israel, all of Israel, the idea of prosecution for hate crimes on social media. Um, Palestinian children are all over social media. They see it, they're exposed to it. Morada Dice will say it's a television, it's social media, it's, it's everything that goes together. Um, and that was then adopted by the, the civilian prosecution, and that will then uh, uh, um, become part of uh, everyday life since then. Hundreds of Palestinians have been prosecuted for hate crimes on social media. Um, it's a whole world in and of itself of, of, of evidence. How do you get to the evidence? How do you prove the evidence? How do you show the chain of, uh, or, 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 of control of, or, or, of the evidence? Computers, it, it's a mess. Um, but it's something which if you want to effectively deal with incitement, it's what I used to explain to my uh, prosecutors is that Inside on social media is like Hyde Park Corner. What is Hyde Park Corner? You've got a crazy standing on a soapbox. And he's shouting out, kill the Jews. That's the guy who writes a post, kill the Jews. What's a share? When you take that post and you share it to all of your friends. Is that also you calling for the same thing? What's a like? So I try to argue that a, a, a like is more more akin to someone standing in the audience and nodding. Kill the Jews! Yeah! That's a good thing to do! Let's blow everyone up! A share is more, I'm taking your message and I'm passing it on to others. I don't know how many others will see that. So it's a problem. Within the social media, how many friends do you have? If you have three friends, and they're your two siblings and your mother, then the effect of that incitement is very limited. If you're Ayat Tamimi and Nariman Tamimi, and you have thousands of followers, the effect is much, is much greater. And you need to take into account all of these different things. Is it something you're, 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 you're I, I, I see your disagreement, and, and I understand it, and, and your, 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 your gut feeling is so true and so correct, but that's not the law. That's not the law. Religious freedom, I'm sure in, in every religion, definitely in Judaism, you can find a text which some crazy will translate or interpret into some way that it means destruction. Is that, was that its original uh, uh, purpose? Without question, not. Um, but people do that. So, so, so. That's incitement as opposed to the act itself. If you're carrying out the crime, then it, it's irrelevant whether you're doing it because of, 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 of Muslim beliefs or whether you're doing it because of nationalistic beliefs. I have to say, most of them, the Muslim side isn't, it isn't really the, the idea of let's go out and kill all the Jews because we're Muslims and that's what we do. That's, I don't <coughs> think that's true. I don't believe that that's true. Um, there are... There are so many examples of, uh, that prove that that isn't true. We have people like uh, Musa Hassan Yusuf, who can, say, who can look inside and say, this isn't the religion that I've learned. Blowing up people isn't the religion that I've learned. There are enough Imams that will explain that, that anyone who's abusing the Quran in that way is abusing the Quran. So to say it's all Muslim motivated, I don't think that's true. I don't think it can be true. Um, the, the repercussions of that are, 
are far more dangerous than anything else because it means that, that it's a war of civilizations, it? which it possibly is, and we would not like to see that. Um, but, uh, but it's a dangerous conclusion. Do you have a question? Right. Abbas is projected in the media around the world as being the moderate leader of the Palestinian Authority. Gaza had an election in which Hamas took power. In the event of an election being called in the Judea and Samaria and Hamas taking power there, what would the Israeli judiciary and the army's response be to one of the leaders who has been, for example, a pretty in jail in Israel, what would their response be to that situation? So I have a slight correction to what you said, okay? Um, the elections that were held in the Palestinian Authority weren't held only in Gaza. They were held all over the Palestinian Authority, including East Jerusalem, which they were given permission to by Ehud Olmot to include the Palestinians living in, Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem in 2000, uh, late 2005, after the death of Yasser Arafat, that was the last election. The party that won them was the Hamas. The Hamas won. The Hamas won the popular vote of the people. <laughs> Mahmoud Abbas, because of the international pressure, because the, the Americans saying, listen, we can't work with the terrorist organization, um, and we won't work with the terrorist organization, and we won't fund you, decided to depose the Hamas leadership. Decided to depose the, the Hamas leadership. That worked in Judea and Samaria because they had a much stronger uh, 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 foothold. It didn't work in, in the Gaza Strip. I would personally help them. Why would I personally help them? Because on the 25th of June, 2006, the world shook for Israel. What happened on the 25th of June, 2006? We woke up in the morning, it's nine o'clock in the morning to the news of an Israeli soldier or a tank sitting outside Gaza has been attacked and an Israeli soldier has been kidnapped. His name is Gilad Shalit. As a result of the, uh, um, the kidnapping of Gilad Shalit, we would arrest every one of the Hamas members of parliament that were elected. There was a, a, a famous one called Muhammad Abu Tir, had a big henna ginger beard. He would explain to us that, well, of course the Hamas ran for the elections. The name Reform and Freedom Party, that was just because they told us that we can't run under the name the Hamas, so we said we're the Reform and Freedom Party. But we're the Hamas. We know they were, and they were all arrested. I, was, I appeared in jail, in, in court with them, um, and they ended up spending three and a half, four years in jail. Um, they've since been released. The Hamas has no interest in having an election. No interest at all in having an election. Not because they fear that they won't win. Because they don't need an election. Why do they not need an election? Because the little part of the, of the, of the PA constitution that was passed says something very simple in the event that the president is incapable of fulfilling his duties he will be replaced by the head of the parliament the head of the parliament was elected in 2006 his name is Abdelaziz Dweck he belongs to which party? the Hamas they're just waiting for him to die they don't even need elections They'll win if there are elections, and they'll win if there aren't elections. Whether the, whether the Fatah and all of the other terrorists who have, uh, uh, who have been supporting Mahmoud Abbas in his uh, um, 15th year of a four-year presidency, um, <laughs> that's what it is. Um, he's a, I understand Mahmoud Abbas is a dictator. You could try and pass it off another way, but Someone who is elected to a certain period of time and then doesn't relinquish power and doesn't hold new elections, he's called a dictator. He is a dictator. Mahmoud Abbas is very intelligent. He holds a doctorate. Do you know what his doctorate is? Holocaust denial. <laughs> the conspiracy of the Zionists with the Europeans to throw the Jews out. <coughs> 
He's not stupid. He's also not going anywhere. I don't know if you saw the news this week. He just bought himself at the ripe old age of 83. Yeah. He needs, he's, 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 he's a world traveler. He just bought himself a new airplane, $15 million. Because there isn't a looming financial crisis in Gaza because of Donald Trump's cutting back on the aid. They can die as long as he has his Cessna. It's all good. And so what will the Israeli authorities do? The Israeli authorities will first and foremost say that the Hamas cannot run as a political party. Cannot run. Cannot run as a political party. Ehud Olmert should never have agreed to that in the first place. He agreed to that under pressure from the Americans. It was a mistake. I cannot see Donald Trump following that same mistake he made. So the chances of that actually being election, elections are very, very slim. On the other hand, I can't see the Fatah and everyone else that are basically stealing money, money hand over fist. Mahmoud Abbas is a very rich man, hundreds of millions of dollars. Never done a day's work in his life. He's just a terrorist. Where did he get all his money from? His two sons have two very big companies that win most of the uh, um, most of the the, uh, 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 the contracts from the Palestinian Authority. I wonder why. It's going to be interesting when he, when when Mahmoud Abbas leaves the scene. What exactly will happen? I don't think anyone really knows. And uh, and it's even more difficult to say what will be the response of the Israeli government. Yes, sir. I've got a question. I think everybody's dying to know the answer to this. A few weeks ago, uh, Donald Trump made a statement that he would move the, Israeli, uh, the American embassy to, to Jerusalem. Now, that went worldwide, and everybody's heard about it. Is that hearsay, or do you think that will ever happen? So, there's actually been a clarification in the last few uh, 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 um, days that the American embassy is going to be moved physically in the next year. By the end of this year, it's going to move. Um, whether they turn the, the, the consulate in, Jeru in Jerusalem into an embassy, or the, whether they turn the, uh, um, one of the other buildings that they have into the embassy, it's meant to move by the end of the year. It will happen. Um, I think uh, 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 Donald Trump truly believes um, that that's the right thing to do. Um, I think he truly believes in the idea of Einstein's definition of an idiot. Or someone who does the same thing over and over again in the same circumstances and expects a different response. We've tried that idea of we can't move the embassy for the last 25 years. It hasn't brought peace. So maybe we should try something else. I think he understands that. I think he's playing into that. And I think he's using basic psychology for children that we, we've all used. What's the worst thing to do with a child when he's having a tantrum? I want give in, right? Because if a child learns that every time you have a tantrum, you're going to give in, then that's the right thing to do. Have a tantrum. The Palestinians have been doing that for the last 50 years. Yeah. Definitely last 25 years. Every time anything bad ha happens, there was a, a, a joke that came out on Facebook a while ago, um, that the Palestinians are having a day of rage, a day of anger, yeah. a day of ire. A day of very annoyed, a day of very, very annoyed, a day of great ire, a day of great anger, a day of great rage. It's every day of the month. You're having a tantrum. And, and everybody says, well, it must, it, it must be Israel's fault. Well, okay, so maybe it's not. Maybe it's time to change that paradigm. Before, before the next question, I don't know how many of you know that Russia recognized Jerusalem <coughs> as the capital of Israel. Yeah. Russia did it eight months ago, and nobody said anything. Nobody complained, nobody objected, nobody demonstrated. But when America does it, it's different. So America wasn't actually the first country to, re to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Because it was eight months after Russia did it. Is that not just the West Jerusalem? Yes, they, they did say that so West Jerusalem, Jerusalem was just West and they did say that East Jerusalem could become the capital of the Palestinians. But regardless of that, they recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Donald Trump said yeah. nothing different, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Doug. Yeah. 
to speak up a bit. Other people force the capital of Israel. The majority would say Jerusalem. They would, of course, they, because it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah we agree with it, but it's more a sort of political objection rather than uh, a general populational recognition. <coughs> okay. Anybody on this side? Jack. I always ask this question. Why does Israel not get the publicity? He, he just made a statement. Russia has declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. The West Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Many people did hear about it. Why I want to know is why does Israel not publicize properly? Why is it that there's everything in the second hand and we don't seem to be able to get into the media here and other parts to get the side of the story? We have to come here to listen to what they tell us, which I agree with a thousand percent. I lived in Israel for years and I used to have <coughs> discussions with the people I lived with. We don't hear about it here. We have to get somebody to speak here. Or we have to look in a corner of the Jewish Chronicle. I get the JP, I get the JP on my uh, phone. I'm not an internet person and I get all the comments that people put in on these things. But why are we so slow to this? So the, so the answer used to be that Israel is just bad at PR, right? That, that they're ineffective, that they're not doing anything, that they aren't interested, that they just don't know what they're doing, and they should hire a good PR firm. Um, I used to buy into that um, until, until I left the army. I hate Tamimi, everybody's heard about, right? Because she's all over the place. <coughs> How many of you had heard about the UNICEF report that says that UNICEF is stealing money from Canada to give it to anti-Israel activities. So there was an article on Fox News in America because they were the only ones who were interested. The rest of the world doesn't care. It's not that Israel isn't doing it. Just, it that isn't news. That anything good is happening in Israel or to Israel isn't news. The BBC doesn't want to talk about that. Sky News doesn't want to talk about that. The ABC in Australia doesn't want to talk about that. channels that are spouting the opposite views of what we have here. And it, you know, it, that's readily available to the man in the street, whereas the Israeli point of view is not available to the man in the street. You're right, it's, and it's not because no, no one's trying to tell the story. Because, be, because, because they, don't want, they don't want to report it. They don't want to report it. His point is the BBC, I sat with the, the, the correspondent for the BBC on the day of the arrest of, uh, uh, of, of Ayat um by the court. Um, there was an article put out by the BBC. They quoted me with my response there. It was all good. I think the point is trying that, to make, sorry, is that there is no equivalent Israeli channel, channel like Al Jazeera. I, I, and if there was, then people would obviously get the, the, so the other point of view. So there is a, a television tra channel called I-24. Two, which, two which doesn't really uh, uh, do anything. Israel as a country doesn't have an international broadcasting organization like that. Um, I think they would rightly consider that type of an organization to be, bit, to be the mouthpiece of, um, of the Israeli government and therefore it would lose its own credibility and therefore it would just wouldn't be worthwhile <laughs> doing. And the other news stations just don't want to talk about it. Next question. What, what is the reason that they won't report it? It's all right saying we don't want to report it, but what reason do they give you why they don't want to report it? They don't, they don't have they're to not give interested or they, have they got backers, have they got people lobbying on the other side telling them not to report it? They, they don't, they, I can't believe that all the BBC and STV reporters are all anti Israel or all don't. They have to have some kind of reason. Oh, so I met with Yolanda, the, the, uh, um, the correspondent for the BBC who lives in Jerusalem, 
She lives in a Palestinian neighborhood. Her children go to school with the Palestinian children. She believes into the, in, 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 in that whole narrative. And she said, I'm not going to print it. I don't have contact to every BBC correspondent all over. And that's not, they have their correspondent in Jerusalem. That's what she writes. And she doesn't care. She only quoted me in the second article because a group called BBC Watch had laid into her for the previous one. It's not just BBC and Sky News, Channel 4 is the same. Yeah. If you watch Channel 4 News, one of the main presenters is John Snow. Mm -hmm. Very anti-Israel. Very anti-Israel. Bombs hate Israel. There was an interview a few uh, 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 weeks ago with uh, Michael Freeman from the Israeli Embassy. Um, with, a, 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 with an interviewer, I forget his name, who simply, simply lied to the audience, distorted the truth. How can you talk about the occupation of the Palestinian people for 50 years as if it's something which, isn't, which is insignificant? What are you talking about, 50 years of occupation? Why 50 years? Because there was a Palestinian state before that? There wasn't. Before the 50 years, there was Jordan who had occupied the area that was meant to be for, the, for an Arab state, not a Palestinian state, for an Arab state. Before that, there was the British Mandate, which was given to set up a Jewish country. Before that, let's only go back 500 years. That was the Ottoman. So going back 500 years, that's the minimum. So why are we talking about 50 years of occupation? And why would a presenter on English television say, how can you ignore the suffering of the Palestinians who have been under occupation for 50 years. But that's what they do. Yeah. We have a couple more, I'm going to have a couple more questions, that's okay. Sorry. Sorry. Did you want to ask one? Yeah, it was just in relation to 50 years. Go ahead. You know, how are the Amnesty International, sorry, how are Amnesty International, Amnesty International have their hashtag 50 years too many, Campaign, how were they allowed to do that if that's wrong, if it's incorrect? Because they're just lying. <laughs> and it's Amnesty International. They, they know, owe no duty to anyone. They need to be called out on it. Say, so why is it only 50 years of occupation? Can I just, just repeat that question? Dave was asking, <clears throat> there's a hashtag out by Am Amnesty International called hashtag 50 years. And she was asking 50 how, too many. 50 years too many, and how is that allowed? But as you were saying, they owe no duty of birth to anybody. They do what they want. They write what they want. They're a charity. They should be closed. They're a charity, but they push political points of view from an unendingly. And also. The push should be to get them to lose their charitable status in England. Because they are far beyond the charity.